Welcome to the Leading by Nature podcast with myself, Giles Hutchins, and my guest today, Mark Buckley, founder of the Aloha Regenerative Foundation, a non-profit foundation that's empowering regenerative futures. Thank you so much, Mark, for being here today. Most welcome. It's so great to be here. Um, We have a little bit of history, and it's always good to speak to you. I'm enamored by all your work. Oh, it's a real pleasure. And we, as always, are going to dive straight in. Um, you are a bit of a polymath in this space, you know, fingers in lots of pies, as it were, exploring many things, an expert of many domains. And perhaps we can start by sharing a bit about the Aloha Regenerative Foundation. Why is it here? Its reason for being? What's its passion and its purpose? Aloha is not the Hawaiian greeting, so I just always like to get that clear because a lot of people confuse it with the Hawaiian greeting. Aloha stands for Adaptive Lifestyle of Health and Sustainability, and it's actually a sinus milieu, which is a, a, a persona of how people interact with our, our living world. And the Aloha Regenerative Foundation true mission and purpose is to empower billions of global citizens to live an adaptive lifestyle of health and sustainability within the safe operating spaces of our planetary boundaries and to do it regeneratively, meaning to keep creating the conditions that are conducive to life to thrive and flourish. Wow. So this is obviously right up my street, uh, hence why we know each other. Uh, you are involved in many initiatives from, you know, ecological economics all the way through to regenerative futures initiatives. And I want to talk a bit about regenerative futures as we get going. But first, I also acknowledge that you travel extensively. You talk to myriad different stakeholder groups. And I'd be really interested, and perhaps the audience will be as well, as sort of, you know, asking you, you know, what are you witnessing happening right now in this space, this, this space that's bubbling up? What are you seeing shifting? What are the emerging trends that you're noticing there's a global awakening occurring a shift in consciousness you know it it's it's much more noticeable now but i have to tell you honestly uh carl sagan said it many many years ago on his show cosmos he said there's this growing consciousness that sees the earth as a single organism and an organism divided amongst itself as doomed And I really see that there's in this awakening of consciousness throughout the world in my travels all over the world, conference centers, United Nations, climate conferences, World Economic Forum, World Government Summit, and just private and and other international organization events, large gatherings. People are not happy with our current systems. They're not happy with the plans and paths and directions that we're going on and it's leading to this what i call this awakening that they're looking for something better they're looking for hope and inspiration new models new systems and really goes back to that uh uh, buck minister fuller saying and you you say this as well and, and speak about him and and that as well um what does a world that works for everyone look like and they're like yeah it's not working for me is is there a model or what what would it look like a better future i i love that and of course i would probably say you know what does a world look like that that is better for all species you know all life and that's the interesting challenge and what i found um and we've been exploring together is it you know whilst that can suddenly get complex because the world and, and life is complex in many ways as Oliver Wendell Holmes once said, you know, the other side of all this complexity is actually a beautiful simplicity. And the deeper we go into this awakening, I think the more we are starting to wake up to something that we have known in our hearts um, for the vast portion of our human history, actually. And that's coming through. That's quite e- interesting uh, as what I call sort of tapping into the rhizome of regeneration. It's a deep sense of connection to life and consciousness. I'm also very interested when we see something out there almost resonating or corresponding with something in here. I think it's quite um, a pivotal moment in humanity. And we're seeing this 
um, as you uh, are speaking to, an increasing awareness of the socioeconomic and environmental challenges and crises, what people are calling this meta crises. And of course, we have the climate emergency, which is part of that. And often we focus on that out there. And it's interesting because lots of these stakeholder groups, you know, the immediate tension obviously goes to out there because we're honed in that achiever fixer mind. Um, and yet what we're also seeing is something shifting in here. Um, and it's almost an acclimatization of our psycho spiritual atmosphere inside is going on with these shifts outside. And they're both happening together. It's not that one's more important than the other, but there is this relationship. Um, and that I find interesting when we look at the organization, when we look at the leader, how we're looking at not just sustainability out there. We're also looking at the culture. How are we showing up? How are we leading our organizations? What are you noticing around regenerative business in particular? Um, when you, you know, you've done a lot of work on um, sustainable development goals, for, for instance, and regenerative futures. Are you noticing anything that's emerging around that regenerative space? Definitely. And it's a it's a beautiful emergence and it's so wonderful to see. Um <clears throat> I need to back up a little bit because I need to put into context how I'm seeing it. So a, a, a big part of, um, and, and this is a mutual person, I believe we both know, John Elkington, who came up with, you know, 30 years ago, the people, planet, profit, the triple bottom line, so to say. Well, when he recalled that triple bottom line in 2018, which is a recall of something that's been misused or is broken or something's wrong with that um, we were seeing before that time a lot of greenwashing a lot of companies using words and terms sustainability and in and, and their uh, um, organization and their structures but they didn't really mean it they were really only focused on the profit and not so much about people and planet and this triple bottom line so when john elkington then came out with the the new release the new uh triple bottom line or the three R's, so to say, it, he came out with responsibility, resilience, and regeneration. And I loved it so much. And I still love it. It's, it's amazing because you can't greenwash it. There's no greenwashing, responsibility, resilience, and regeneration. Within days to months, within one year period of time, if you're an organization trying to greenwash in regeneration, it quickly comes to light because it has to do with the living world. It has to do with that mycorrhiza, that mycelium, that way that the world works and lives. And regeneration is not new. It's not a new buzzword or trend. It's been around for 3.8 billion years. It's how life on earth emerged. And so there is no greenwashing it, green painting it, or faking it. It comes quickly to light, and especially when a pandemic uh, or something like that occurs, you can see, do you have resilience? Do you have regeneration? Obviously not. And so if you ingrain that into your business model and you really mean it and, and you do it, one, it's, it's, it's virtually impossible to greenwash, but then it's a better model. It's a better model for life. It's a better model for your organization. And those who I've seen really jump on this bandwagon, uh, I, I, I believe I told you before at the World Economic Forum, I was at Davos uh, two years ago, and uh, these companies and businesses were taking regeneration into their mouth and talking about it. Um, I was like, I was shocked because I was like, what? How, how do they even know about that? And, and um, are, they, are they trying to fake it? And uh, they quickly realized that they couldn't fake it. And they had to really jump on board and figure out what it means. I mean, uh, now Nestle, uh, one of the biggest food companies in the entire world who has a lot of controversy, a lot of negative things that they've done, uh, they're, they're dealing with almost a, a million farmers around the world trying to help them transition to regeneration. And they're realizing there is no fake in it. There's no putting plastic or wrapping it up fancy they actually have to do it and support that transition and and one reason they really jumped on board it's a better model for life it's a better model for the organization they're seeing not only they secure their supply chains not only do they give them resilience um, but they're also regenerating their resources and helping those 
people to be long-term, deep kinship relationships to heal the earth, to heal their supply chain, to regenerate it, and to do better in the future. Um, there's still a lot of controversy around there, but I see that in many, many places. That's what people are, are, are and organizations are doing. And it's such a beautiful thing to see that emergence and that shift towards that. And there's a lot of work to do. There's a lot of help uh, that people need. Uh, and uh, need, first of all, need to read your book, Leading by Nature, because it's a, a plethora of help to, to, to make that transition and to know, you know how, how to do it properly. Well, there's a lot there. And I'd like, you know, just, you know, it's interesting talking about companies like Nestle, there'll be some people in the regenerative movement who are like, oh, ouch, how can anything exactly. like that ever be regenerative? And and this isn't about a holier than thou uh, destination that w one can never reach. It's actually a journey of intent. And, and And if the intention is there to truly journey towards what you're talking about, this deep kinship, this understanding of a deep connection uh, to life, to nature, to inner and outer ways of working, then I think we should have the doors open to everyone rather than trying to be exclusive. I work with some large corporates who I feel the intention is right, albeit there's a lot to do, but we need everyone starting to journey on this way to life. Now, you mentioned Leading by Nature, um, which is, of course, also the name of this podcast and the book. You know, how did you first come across my work? And and I, I think now you've you've ended up reading um, um, a number of my books. Um, and, um, you know, we actually met through your podcast. You kindly invited me to be on your podcast. Is there anything you want to share about Leading by Nature and how it relates to your work? Uh, uh, absolutely. So I came... Uh, um roundabout I've, i have all of your books and i and i, and I cherish and, and love them all i've seen your your work over the years and uh we first and foremost we had a wonderful podcast i have a podcast inside ideas that you were on and we spoke about leading by nature and uh regenerative leadership and and some of your other work with laura storm and your other other books a little bit but mainly about leading by nature and how it really touched me my organization and fit so nicely and, and i was honest to tell you that before i i'd read leading by nature um my favorite book of all time was and not um not that old actually was um the web of meaning by jeremy lent um, because it was a culmination of all the wisdom knowledge schooling education systems uh, symbiosis, putting everything together in one book and then moving towards that direction, towards ecological civilizations, towards regeneration and what are the models in the future. I really loved it. He was also on the podcast. But then when I read your book, it just totally topped the web of meaning. And I have to apologize to Jeremy Lent that, that you know, hey, uh, sorry, no, no hard feelings, but you really also complete completely cover all the aspects give good practical wisdom to get out of the just the uh theory and philosophy into the actual transformation to apply to your organization and uh that podcast has been a numerous success uh um that we had and, and resonated with people all over the world went out to 1.2 million people on apple news and and uh, has numerous views and feedback. And then, you know, I, I ended up giving everybody in the foundation and many other organizations that book as their their tool book, their guidebook to kind of uh, make that shift and and transformations because it resonates from chapter to chapter, from beginning to end. It's not only a great read, but I, I feel like it's a guide. It's never uh, far away from reach wherever I go. And, um, uh, you know, just just the other day was tell, telling people there saying, OK, what would you suggest? And it's the first thing I always recommend because it's really uh, easy to uh, understand, easy to to uh, find out how you can apply it into your life, into your organization and um the results are immediately uh, noticeable. So as I gave it to my uh, founding members of my foundation, 
um, at our annual meeting, and you also did a little uh, video for us. Um, within three days after I gave that book out at the annual meeting, I got four calls back from the members that had already finished the book and said, thank you, thank you, thank you. And this is applicable here. And then this is what I'm doing. This is how I'm using it. Uh, boy, you've opened my view to things that I had never and didn't understand. And these people are in the in, in the Aloha's Regenerative Foundation. They're already on the regenerative path and they're already wise, super people and very sustainable uh, in their practices and being. And even they weren't fully aware of what what it means and how to apply it and 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 the the great things that the wisdom that, that can be found gosh um well i have to say i'm in awe of of your work and um, we have different energies we do different things and that's what we need this diversity you're out there we obviously share a very similar i feel sort of um soul font if you like uh, i'd also like to thank laura storm who originally connected you know that made the connection in my mind to you and your work i mean just seeing you out there doing everything you do this sort of relentless uh, love you must have i feel because uh, it's also something i I'm, I'm i'm deeply passionate about is working with our soul craft and when we work with our soul craft there's a love that comes through what we do it doesn't feel so much like inverted commas work it is obviously still work and it requires inner work all the time it's not like we're suddenly perfect far from it but we are flowing we're, we're kind of doing our thing it's our passion i'd like to ask a bit about you yourself you know what drives you um how did you get involved in all this you know could you share a bit about your own personal journey you bet. I, I've been doing this for 32 years, um, and I'm I'm with many different organizations. Not only on my own foundation, but I am an ambassador and an advocate and an advisor for the United Nations. I I work for the World Economic Forum, and I'm part of their expert member network group. I uh, advise and consult for the uh, World Government Summit as a futurist to try to help them create the future of governance. I uh, sit on the PSF commission for the European Union for the e ESG taxonomy. And I am uh, want to kind of describe you a little bit more about uh, kind of what my journey has been. So I've been fortunate to have the, some of the best mentors and education uh, possible in the sustainable space. I um, studied ecological economics with the second father of ecological economics, Herman Daly. Sadly, he passed away two years ago in October and uh, uh, I miss him dearly, but his legacy and his work still is vibrant and living uh, in our earth every day. Uh, most people think economics, what in the heck does that have to do with regeneration, with sustainability? Um, it has everything to do with it. There are three dimensions of sustainability, and the first one is economics. Second one is innovation, and the, the, the last one is futures or future uh, the future, uh, regenerative futures, if, if uh, I have my way um, to kind of set that vision. But there, it's not good enough to be an activist or complain about all the crappy and poor economic models we have in our world, neoclassical, uh, extractive GDP, capitalism. Um, you actually have to know what economic models can replace those really horrific uh, uh, e economic models. And that's where ecological economics come in. And most people don't even know that they can all Every human being on earth can name five ecological economic models, and they're really not even aware of it. I ask other economists this, and, and believe it or not, they even tell me, no, oh, I, I can't name five, but I know they can. Everybody's heard of circular economy. Everybody's heard of um, donut economics. There's regenerative economics. The sustainable development goals are an ecological economic model. The SDGs are an economic model. There's well-being economics. There's um, uh, post-growth and degrowth economics. There's well-being economics. There's more than 32, and there's new ones coming every single day, planetary boundaries and 
and all, uh, you know, feminist economics and Buddhist economics, all sorts of fabulous things out there. Um, and how, how, how does that apply? Well, it applies because that's how our world uh, functions and we need to find a system to kind of keep us flowing into the future. And the reason I like regenerative economics the best is because it actually is the way the core basis of that is the way our world's always worked. And it ties us back to nature and all other species and connects us intrinsically to that. So, I mean, that's a big part of me and, and studying with Herman Daly the the father of the circular economy, William McDonough, is a really good friend of mine. Bill McDonough, uh, we see each other a couple times a year, but he's my architect and worked with me on many uh, things to try to get that cradle to cradle, that circular economy and things. So um, I, I love architecture and that whole concept of that. So now, why would an architect, William McDonough, who wrote Cradle to Cradle and Upcycling, um, have anything to do with economics? Well, he does because he builds the built environment. He wants to think, how will human beings live in the future without harming our planet? So again, that tie back to economics. I was one of the first 50 people trained by Al Gore and his ranch in Carthage, Tennessee. I mean, both of his movies are uh, The Inconvenient Truth and the sequel to The Inconvenient Truth and was trained as a climate leader and a country manager for Germany and Austria. And then I'm a futurist. So uh, the reason I'm a futurist is I have been working on the next iteration of goals after the sustainable development goals. You no, know, they're called the re resilient development goals. I wish they were called the regenerative development goals. And they go for from December 2030 to December 2050. And so thinking about what are the models and and goals uh, that should help guide us to, to that regenerative future, a better way of living, uh, evolution of humanity to be more in one and in alignment with Gaia, with our earth. And that's just a, a few of the, of the things that I do and, and talk about and who I am and how I've studied. But um, it just, it drives me, it fulfills my soul. And I only call it work for other people. Because for me, it's not work. I love it. I jump out of bed. I work weekends. I, I love what I do because it fulfills me. And I know I can see that better world in front of me and what we're working to. And I get to speak with beautiful, wonderful people like you who uh, are contributing amazing things to our world. Wow. I, I mean, can I just jump in there just before you start that next sentence, Jazz? Can you just say that last bit again, Mark? Because it was so perfect and beautiful but we just had a bit of lag and i'm worried that okay. that the video might not have picked that up i'm sure the audio would have but um just what last little bit <laughs> just that last little clip which is the last five or ten seconds i'm so sorry to ask it would just be a it'd be really lovely to capture that again sorry to jump in i i, I almost forgot I know. what i said i know i i, I yeah I sorry well, it was just sort of um Oh, I can't remember now. It was sort of to do with just how the regenerate. It was you were talking about something. What are the acronyms? You wish it was regenerative. Um, Don't worry about it, Cal. It'll be yeah. fine. We'll sorry. come back to okay. it at the end. We'll come back to it at the end and redo it's, it at the end. I yeah. think. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, guys. Yeah. Because if it's only about the video, we don't need that. You're not going to okay. use the whole video, are you, Mark? You're just going to take no. little clips out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just thought it was a perfect bit. It, it'll be fine in audio. So if you if you're happy without video, then no, he he was on a okay. roll there, brother. He was on a roll. Oh, okay. I, it, I, it finished. I, I, I'm trying perfect. to repeat what I said. I'm trying to think. No. Yeah. Let's, let's don't let's not do that. Yeah. Okay. So I'll just allow a pause. I'll, yeah, I'll allow a pause and then I will ask this question. Yeah. We're getting we're getting to the end now, Mark. So it's all good. Thank you. So, wow, I can, as I say, a sort of polymath in this field, there's so much that you're drawing on. And I love how you nod to people like Bill, Herman, uh, Buckminster, John, and I'd like to give a, a nod to the other John, John Fullerton for his work. And there's many um, others as well, like uh, Dana Zohar, um, uh, Carol Samford, 
um, uh, Janine Benyus. There's many people um, who have really just helped sort of develop this. And we are standing on the shoulders of a lot that's happening. But we are breaking through, it feels. You know, we've got we've got to be careful because we, we don't want to be in an echo chamber. And obviously we are. We're, we're very much in it. But I do feel like you that there is an awakening happening. There's a shift that's starting to happen, which is amazing. And I think the the big parties are coming into the room. And when I mean the big parties, I don't mean the corporates or or the power powerhouses. I actually mean spirit and soul and our love for life is starting to enter. Uh, now, talking of that, any little final tips that you might have for others on this journey that you've learned along your way? Absolutely. And I want to kind of tie it to um, why I chose the mission um, for the Aloha's Regenerative Foundation and kind of what we do. It's closely tied to my own purpose for existing, my own why and what what I do. And so when you have you found your own personal why and your own purpose for existing, um, if you work for someone else or or have your own organization or even your family construct, if those two missions and purposes are aligned, boy, how how well does life go? How how much do you feel fulfilled? And that's what we need to do. You know, we 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 want to make sure people are fulfilled in their lives. If you work for someone, if you have an organization that you work for, wouldn't you be much more happy or have jobs, job satisfaction if you were aligned with their purpose and, and, and say, boy, I just sold my soul to to work for for some company, uh, but I'm it didn't fulfill me. And we need to make sure that alignment is there because we're not in the business of business. We're in the business of life. We are truly in the business of life to create the conditions that are conducive for life to thrive and flourish, to make sure that we're all happy and all species are happy and that we can continue this for as long as possible for future generations beyond ourselves because we've been given a fabulous gift uh, to be here on this earth. We won the lottery to be here. The likelihood of being born is so uh, uh, quad quadrillion uh, trillions likelihood that we were born. And now that we're here, we shouldn't waste a second of that, that time not trying to uh, realize what a wonderful gift we, we, we have. And um, there's specific things that we should act. So my why and purpose for existing really is not about me becoming a billionaire or famous or, or anything so about myself. It's about me blending that with uh, not only the consciousness, but Gaia, our earth, as an earthling to make sure it, things are going well for all of us on this planet. And when that happens, then it automatically goes well for me as well and my organizations as well. And in Aloha's Regenerative Foundation, we only want to do transformations. I don't talk about change or I don't talk about projects because they have a start and an ending. In life, uh, the only start and ending is a birth and death, but really, um, I these aren't projects we're talking about. We're talking about transforming humanity, a paradigm shift, a shift in consciousness, awakening that takes us into another age or epoch where we want to be. And so we do transformations. We do um, the Aloha's Eco Center, transforming infrastructure in the way we produce food. We do the Resonance Project dot Earth to talk about frequency and consciousness and how we can use not language uh, to transcend cultures and boundaries and nations to bring humanity together to resonate on the same frequency to be aligned in in, in our mission as earthlings. And uh, those are just some. And what one other great one that I'm really excited about is we have, have a wonderful transformation that's called uh, the world that works for everyone fellowship um, gathering and, and it's the gathering of all the 8 billion uh, plus souls on, on our planet to align and try to figure out what does a world that works for everyone. And if we already know, how can we create these new models 
to to carry us into a next evolution of of humanity. So when when I, you know I told you I wrote the Sustainable Development Goal Manifesto for the United Nations. The reason I did that is to give us a vision of what that future would look like in December 2030. Um, but we need to have some kind of a vision or purpose to work for. But sustainable development is what? It's development of inner and outer of our world, the world that we live in and how we live. What is just regular development? Well, it's the built environment. It's real estate, commercial, residential, city and country scale development. Some countries are under development because they don't have roads and clean water and sanitation and infrastructure. That's development. And it's an economy. What's sustainable development? It's an ecological economy. It's not the best, but it's the low carbon scenario, circular economy, better tools, better environments, better materials with less emissions and less human uh, 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 suffering and less emissions for an evolution in how we live our lives. Do we live one of worth that we have the basic needs covered? And eventually we want to go to that regenerative development so that we can have a world that works in symbiosis and harmony with the natural world and all other living beings to create those conditions that are conducive for life to thrive and flourish. And fix a lot of the human suffering and global grand challenges that we have in this earth. And it's just, honestly, I, I, I always, uh, I hate to say this, but I, I always have to go back to the, the business model side of it. Is it profitable? You know, that's what everybody talks about. It's a better model. It's a better model for life. Not, it's a no brainer. Not only is, is, is it more profitable, but it's what we call a super exponential and it goes into quantum tunneling. It's abundant. Uh, you could put any capitalistic or extractive model, organization model or economy head to head to an ecological economic model, a regenerative model. They're not competing one against another, but the regenerative model is so abundant, it will blow the other one out of the water, so to say. It's just so abundant, thriving, flourishing, regenerating. Uh, it's a, it's a living system. And so you probably uh, you've probably kind of thought of you say marks all over the place food and agriculture and economics and and this and that well don't be confused it's the systems view of life i'm a systems thinker i studied system science with fritz Ulf capra and i see the world in systems of systems and that's the important thing we need to view the world as a big system and we need to not just address one facet of that system, we need to address all the facets of a complex system in order to solve human suffering and our global grand challenges. Fascinating. And of course, the other side of all of that complexity is the beautiful simplicity, which is this alignment, this fulfilling yourself in the service of life that you talk about, moving to a new epoch around res resonance and coherence. Regeneration is not some heavy, complex, rational, analytic model. It's actually about a deep care, a deep kindred love of life. Celebrating the gift of life is what you talked about there, allowing our heartbeat to attune with the heartbeat of Gaia. Fascinating, Mark. This has been a great conversation. Um, thank you so much for being here with me today. You're most welcome. It's been a sheer pleasure. I hope we can do it again. <laughs>